This week we're going to look at children in the courtroom uh, as a special class of victims or witnesses. Now, when we think of children, there are two major issues that you need to think about. One is whether their competence as witnesses. Are children, especially kids of a certain age, not competent to be witnesses? Are they just simply not good enough to pass the kind of tests that we need uh, from witnesses in a courtroom? So their competence, their abilities is one thing. The next the other thing that we're going to consider and talk about is understanding the legal process uh, when they do have to testify. Can they understand what, what is happening in the courtroom? Can they understand cross-examination? Can they understand the questions that lawyers tell them? Um, can they promise to tell the truth? So um, we're going to be looking at these two issues in a series of lectures. But before we do, let's just talk about what it is that we're talking about with regard to children. Okay. Um, let's start with competence. Now, we've talked about eyewitness memory, and we have mentioned that age is a, a variable in terms of eyewitness ability. And as I said before, children are less competent uh, in uh, eyewitness identification, especially in lineup identification. They're much more likely than older people to identify innocent foils. Um, and this is true in target present, but especially true in target absent lineups. It seems that children, when they they get a lineup, they feel compelled to identify somebody in the lineup, even when uh, the target isn't even there. So there might they may feel less social pressure more than adults do. However, the problems go well beyond uh, things like eyewitness memory. So let's talk about this a little bit. First of all, I've got this. It's rather old data, but I, it's a great chart, and it makes the point that I want to make. Um, this is Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. This is their data from 1996. And this was um, the data from 96 of every person in their database who had victimized children and the type of crime that they had committed. And here you go. Here's the important thing to note, to look at, to note, when you look at this chart, and it's probably going to be the same if you looked at the data from 2016, you see that children, when they are victims of crimes, they're most likely to be victims of either sexual abuse or rape. Okay, uh, Chances are sexual assault, sexual abuse is somebody that they know. Rape would be possibly a stranger. However, if you think about these kinds of cases, especially sexual abuse and probably rape as well, there are really only two witnesses to this crime, uh, the perpetrator and the victim. Um, when in some of these other um, types of crime, obviously murder we're not talking about here, there may be other people around. But what's going to happen in a sexual assault or sexual abuse or rape, it's going to, the child is going to need to be able to describe what happened to them. Also, I just want to point out that sexual abuse uh, reporting trends, again, this is this uh, data is kind of dated, but I just want to show you the trends um, in sexual abuse reporting. Uh, if we followed this chart out to 2016, we'd find in more recent years, we'd see that reporting has continued to climb. Okay, So people are more willing to come forward and report sexual abuse. But what this all means then is that there will be more children involved in the legal system because there's reporting, more reporting, and because children, if they are involved in crimes, are likely involved in crimes where they're going to be key witnesses to the crime. Now, before the 1980s, there were lots of legal barriers that kept children from testifying in court. Uh, sometimes, uh, for certain ages, they had to go through competency hearings. Uh, sometimes um, there had to be corroborating evidence. So in other words, if the child is the only witness uh, to the crime and there's no other corroborating evidence, they couldn't bring that uh, case to trial. So in the, 19, in the early 1980s, so you really didn't see a lot of children in the courtroom or in the legal setting. However, that changed. In the 1980s, something really uh, strange happened in this country. There was a series of daycare sexual abuse scandals that occurred in the 1980s where virtually all of the children that were alleging abuse were young kids. Uh, most of the kids that you see here in these different cases 
were under the age of five. So the McMartin Preschool, you're going to watch a video about um, that particular daycare case. And the Felsacre daycare case, another one you'll be seeing a video about. Um, but all of these, like McMartin, Country Walk, Fells, um, the We Care, Little Rascals, uh, they were all daycare case cases in which there were allegations of sexual abuse. And so that exploded in this country in the 1980s. And so what happened was that the state started to responding to these allegations by changing um, some of the, um, the statutes that kept kids from testifying. For example, in the 80s, many states rewrote their statutes to allow more involvement of child witnesses. After all, they have a, an explosion of cases and allegations, and they had many barriers that kept children from testifying. And that was good. States then, uh, for example, they relaxed their corroboration rules. Uh, they also relaxed their competency requirements and allowing more kids to testify. However, at the same time that this was going on, the scientists, the psycholegal researchers, began to criticize the way that children were questioned in those daycare cases that I just talked to you about. They saw the way in which those children were being questioned and they questioned the legitimacy of the interviewing techniques that some people were using. And those scientists started an inquiry into the questioning of children. And they were asking questions like, if you ask children questions in the way that they were being asked in these daycare cases, could you bring about false allegations or could you alter children's testimony? So you saw what happened here in the 80s then was there was a legal system response to allegations, but there was also a scientific response to the allegations. So let's take a look at false allegations. What are false allegations? Um, believe it or not, the answer to the question is not that easy. So what is a false allegation? Obviously, one type of false allegation is that the child is lying. Okay? The child knowingly gives a false report. Okay? So let me give you an example of knowingly giving a false report. This is a case. Okay? Members of the San Diego Grand Jury, County Jan Grand Jury recently learned of fourth graders using false allegations of sexual abuse against their substitute teacher. The teacher told police his fourth grade class became unruly during his May 4th, 1994 assignment. When the substitute threatened to report their misbehavior, a nine-year-old girl offered to pay 10 of her classmates $1 each if they falsely claimed the substitute fondled them. Fortunately, the substitute was never charged, but is also yet to receive another teaching assignment. Police cleared him after some of the 10 children made inconsistent statements. This is an obvious case of lying, a fabrication. However, this is not um, even though fabrication is one of the ways that you get a false allegation, I would say that intentionally lying is an unusual type of false allegation. So let's go back again. Deceptions or lying on the part of the child. The actuality is that lying is really a non-issue in most cases of child sexual abuse. In other words, it doesn't happen very often. So let's take a look at other types of false allegations. Sometimes false allegations come about because the adults in a case misunderstand a child's statements. And so the child is not giving a false statement, but rather the adults are misinterpreting a child's statement. Let me give you an example of adults misunderstanding a child's statement. When a four-year-old asked her mother to lick her tushy, her mother became very alarmed and demanded to know where the child had done that before. When the child responded at daddy's house, the mother became too upset to ask further questions and proceeded to take legal action against the father. Meanwhile, the child kept asking to go to daddy's house to get her tushy licked. After considerable furor and outrage on both sides, it was discovered in the course of evaluation that the child had been engaging in sex play at the father's house, 
but the perpetrator was actually his new puppy. Unbelievable as it seemed at first, the child's detailed descriptions of the incidents, when she was finally encouraged to tell the whole story, were confirmed by direct observation of the child playing with the dog. So here's a, a case where you have an example where the child is not fabricating something, but the adults uh, in this situation uh, completely misread her statements. And you'd be amazed at how many times we do not listen to children or ch we misinterpret what children tell us. Any of you that have ever worked with children, you know that this is true, that sometimes it's very difficult to understand what they're saying. So in terms of definitions, we have lying, we have adult misunderstanding of children's stories. And then the final, which I believe is something that we saw very clearly in these 1980s child sexual abuse cases, is adults who are overzealous in the belief that abuse has occurred. So this is where a child uh, is not necessarily saying anything, but adults are interpreting a child's behavior as being consistent with sexual abuse. And here's a, a tragic example of professionals who pr pursue abuse allegations without evidence. A seven-year-old boy was brought to therapy. He had trouble sleeping and was deathly frightened of two older boys who lived up the block. He didn't want to leave his mother or leave his home, so he was uh, school phobic. He had an acute anxiety attack every time he heard a siren or saw a police car. When he was four and a half years old, during a bitter divorce of his parents, a daycare worker thought he was being too aggressive in his play. He was playing by having cars crash together and TV characters fighting with swords. She had read lists of behavioral indicators of sexual abuse, so she reported it. Two social workers came to the daycare, interrogated the child using anatomical dolls, concluded that he was abused, and took him into protective custody. When his mother came to pick him up that afternoon, she was told he had been taken away, but no one would tell her where. It took nine months before the child was returned, nine months during which he was repeatedly interrogated by social workers and police. He was physically examined three times, for example, having a physician stick two fingers up his anus, while asking him if his mommy did this. He was in one children's hospital, two foster holding homes, and three treatment foster homes. When he was the uh, first returned to his mother, he didn't leave her side for three days. Now you can see clearly here, this is um, a tragic uh, case where adults mistakenly identify abuse. And when adults make mistakes like that, it's not an innocuous or benign conclusion. Uh, what, when you decide that, or think that a child is abused and put a child through this with very little evidence, you can actually abuse the child. This, what happened to that poor little boy, in my mind, amounts to child abuse. And sadly, this is not uh, an unusual situation, I have to be honest with you. I worked in cases before where um, this one case in Colorado where they um, a school counselor was alleging that a young girl had been sexually abused. And the reason um, for this allegation was that the counselor had given her a test where they, she had shown the child pictures and asked the child to make up stories that have to do with the pictures. And what she said was the child's stories were so positive that it was clear that she was repressing memories of sexual abuse. So this is the kind of thing that can happen to children um, in the legal system. So how often do false allegations occur? Well, it's hard to estimate, to be honest with you, but uh, the best estimates that we have based on various reports and articles is about 5 to 8% of allegations are false. However, and we're going to see this here in a uh, in the next lecture when we talk about some of this, those, those false reports um, get considerably higher when you include instances where the child is not intentionally fabricating the story. So what I'm going to say here, and this is going to just sort of lead to the next uh, lecture, is that there are instances where children might come to believe certain things that happen to them that are not true. So the child does report that something happened when in fact it did not. 
And estimates of false allegations coming from these kinds of situations um, are about as high as 23%. So it's not uh, a rare number. 23% is getting dangerously high. So whatever the rate, as an investigator, if you had to investigate an allegation of child sexual abuse, how does that affect your behavior? Um, and we're going to talk about some of the ways in which um, we now recommend that you uh, interview children to avoid making errors, but you could decide that um, you're not going to consider this at all, and you're just going to interview the child whether or not the report is false or not, or you could consider that the child might be making a false report and go in and try to figure out whether in fact that's the case, or you could become suspicious of every child's report. I would guess, I would say that being suspicious or being not suspicious at all is not really the right answer. Next time we're going to talk more about what the um, researchers have done to show us how these false allegations can come about. Thank you.